I'm pretty sure that we're struggling with very powerful social forces and we're culturally nervous about people who require assistance. There's something that scares us collectively. And you can sort of see it in the debates at home and I guess to some degree here about people who rely on benefits, that something about that makes us susceptible to this is a difference that's somehow bad. And so at least where I come from, there's this kind of vulnerability that we've all got to create distance and to assume that people who require help have to pay for the help with their freedom. We are haunted, if you like, and the, the ghosts haven't been laid yet. So the possibility of people exerting unreasonable control over people with disabilities is something that we're all vulnerable to all the time. It's just it's part of what we have to struggle with. And people with disabilities themselves have to struggle with that too. And so Jackie's beautiful image of people saying, I will live a smaller life because it's safe for me. And the only way out of the cocoon is for people to feel inside themselves that more can be. And one of the keys to that is are the people that I'm in a relationship with, are the people that I count on, people who believe in me, and people who have hope that the world can be a more welcoming place for me. So we're kind of haunted, and words aren't enough to keep the ghosts out. Right? Words, doesn't matter how good the words are, that's they're, they're not enough. So it seems to me like whatever else we need, we need a way to be mindful. And I don't know the, the right way to say this in English, but at home it's the sort of, huh? <laughs> Mama, huh? We did what? Right? And most of the time, people are just doing it. It's automatic. It isn't a sort of front of your brain. I will now squash this person down and or I will now do something that's completely ridiculous. Oftentimes it just kind of happens. In 1971, a guy called Philip Zimbardo uh, did a social psychology experiment, and you likely know this story, but I'll just remind you of it. The United States Supreme Court had established a very strong statement about prisoners' rights, the rights of people in prison. Uh, it is a very powerful statement. It talks about people deserving respect. It talks about people being free of fear, people being free of violence. It's a wonderful statement. It would be hard to find better words. And Phil wondered, how's that actually going to work out in a prison? <coughs> and so he made a prison. He hired 40 uh, young college males, uh, university student males, for two weeks in the summertime. He divided the group in half, literally randomly, said, this half gets a khaki shirt and a pair of mirrored sunglasses, okay? You're the guards. This half gets a t-shirt that says prisoner and a shower cap. And the reason they had 
shower caps is that the, the habit in American prisons is supposed to do you know, people really close haircuts. And these guys wouldn't give up their hair <laughs> for the experience. So everybody had to have, everybody had to and that's all he did. And then he gave both groups an orientation as they would receive in a California state prison. And the prisoners learned that they had rights and that they were entitled to respect and dignity. And the guards learned that the prisoners had rights and they were entitled to respect and dignity. And there was a handbook right, taken from the California Corrections uh, with like 80 pages of Here's how you're supposed to handle this, and here's how you're supposed to handle that. And then they weren't even in cells. It was just an old dormitory building. Uh, people were to a room. There weren't locks on the doors. And within six days, they had to stop the experiment because the guards were brutalizing the prisoners. And the guard's story was, right, oh, they, they, they weren't issued these, but people started to come. They went and bought nightsticks. They went and bought gloves, right, at the Army-Navy store. The guards started to show up with weapons because the prisoners wouldn't follow orders. And this, within two or three days, this kind of elaborate culture happened, with the only intervention being you guys are the guards, and you guys are the prisoners. One of the many things he came to from that was the notion that structure really matters. That lots of times people want to escape by finding the bad apple, when really the issue is a bad barrel. Right? The, the social structure is what? is creating the trouble. And you can't magically get rid of it with words, no matter how eloquent the words are. I thought we might try something like this. Uh, Sally has very kindly cre uh, collected from the workshops some things people have talked about uh, enough Moments where you say, huh? What, 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 were, what were they thinking? Right? So we've, we've got that piece to start with. And we each came home, we'll take one. And we'll do four things between now and mid afternoon. So the first thing we'll do is have a discussion and think about what are the consequences of this? Right? Here's, a, here's an experience, here's a moment. I'll tell you one that I just heard the other day from, uh, from uh, 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 the United States. A year ago, uh, a person was uh, in a group from a group home in a van. The day was hot. The person fell asleep in the van. They were going to the park. Everybody else got out to be in the park together. The other uh, five people who lived in this home and their, and their staff. One of the other people, one of the people who got out, um, started to dysregulated, started to have a hard time. People paid a lot of attention to that situation. And the person in the van uh, died. And we don't really know why. Very hard to say. So this is a terrible situation. And you think something like that shouldn't happen. The organization's response to it had lots of pieces, but one of the pieces was this. They said, people are not allowed to go out, right? They're not allowed to leave the group home if the temperature is above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't even know what that is in Celsius, but 
20 feet or nine, something like that. So, we go five miles. Okay, good. So, 85 degrees, which is not an uncommon US summer temperature. So, if it's 85, everybody in this whole agency, and this agency supports almost 2,000 people, has to stay in. So, that's one of those, huh? How, how did that happen? Okay, so we want to think about, and you'll have your own on your table. It won't be like that one, but it'll be your own. So we'll have a look at it and see what are the consequences of that for people with disabilities, for the support staff, for building a positive culture. 